Thank you. It's good to be here. I have already been blessed with the worship. I want to thank the uh, worship team for being obedient and directing your gifts to help lead us into God's presence. Uh, I was particularly touched today, as I am sometimes, and uh, I trust that the, uh, that's sort of evidence to me that God is here. Um, we have some te technical difficulties last night. One of the projectors kicked off. If that happens today, don't worry. God doesn't leave just because the video does. So he's, he's, he's going to see us through. Um, and another little warning. When you have a guest speaker, you have to put up with all kinds of nonsense. So I, I actually created too many slides. So I'll be directing the guys in the slide to skip some. It uh, doesn't change the message. I just, I'm really not a preacher. You'll, you'll catch on real quick that I'm really not a preacher. I'm more of a teacher. Teachers tend to go 45 minutes to 60 minutes, not 30. So, you know, I'm, I'm figuring this out as I go. Pastor Andy called three months ago and said, would you come and talk to our people about depression? And I said, I'd be happy to do that. Looked at the calendar, but it's Mother's Day. I mean, what a, what a great thing for mothers. Let's reflect upon the depression in our lives as we, <laughs> as we celebrate mothers. So I said, let's, let's call it Keys to Happiness. And, and I'll just weave some things. He says, well, I really want you to talk about depression. I said, I will, but I think, I think we can do something that is uh, honoring of mothers. And, uh, and so I'm, a, I'm more of a teacher, but I'm also a testifier. You know, wherever I go, I'm called to testify to what God has done in my life, not to glorify my life. I'm just a regular guy, but to glorify a God who can take a regular guy and give him a chance to talk to a bunch of people on a Sunday morning about what has God, God has done for him. And so you'll see that um, as I introduce myself... Uh, before I was a psychologist, before I had any uh, degrees or adult responsibilities, I was a preacher's kid. And, and so I grew up with, uh, with a long heritage of, of pastors and missionaries, and I actually thought I was being you know, called to be a pastor, but I got directed into psychology, and uh, that has been you know, my great adventure. So I got married in 77 to the, the, the bride of, of my life. Uh, we met in college. And we've had three grown sons, all of whom are healthy, serving the Lord. God's been very, very good to me. I started Eden Counseling in 95, and that was the start of not my first great adventure, but a really huge adventure that goes on to this day. And what an adventure means, right? Think about any great adventure story. The best part is when you think the guy's going to die. That's, the, that's part of an adventure, right? And so after you know, getting rolling with Eden Counseling, I entered into a season of tremendous anxiety. I knew how to counsel, I knew how to draw people in, I didn't know how to run a business. And so uh, about the third month when I couldn't pay myself, I realized, man, this thing might not work. And being the kind of perfectionist that I am, the thought of losing face, of looking like a failure, I began stopping to sleep. And so I went six weeks on five minutes to 45 minutes a night of sleep. And if, I don't recommend that to anybody. Uh, you, will, you will know what it means to be sleep deprived and all the good stuff that brings with us. But for three years, I wrestled with severe anxiety. And came out of that, I, I fixed the problems I needed to fix, and it took a year for my body to catch up and get back to normal. And then I kind of chugged along for a while until 2008, when I was diagnosed with a, with a syndrome that could leave me deaf, could leave me unable to sit up, could leave me with chronic pain. And the, uh, the lifestyle changes I had to make to, uh, to accommodate that, plus significant losses in my life, all piled up, led me into another season where I stopped sleeping, uh, but I got help right away, so the sleep kind of was okay. But, but God took me through a season of depression during this time. So on top of the anxiety, I entered into about two years of depression to where every morning I knew that I would get up without the capacity to feel good. And I'll expand on that in a couple of minutes. So I knew that there's, no matter what I did, I would not feel good for two years until I went to my physician and said, look, this just isn't working. I want you to try something that will boost dopamine in my system. Will you, will, you, will you give me Wellbutrin? Dopamine is necessary to feel good. And so part of what you're going to hear today is scripture, some of the traditions of the church, integrated with psychology, because that's what I do. So you're going to hear a little bit of science and a little bit of scripture. And in my own testimony, I needed a boost of dopamine for three months to quick start my system to where I could feel good. And today I feel good, and I'm grateful for that. I, I believe that it is miraculous that any of us has the opportunity to feel good in the world that we live in today. So, you know, my own life is a testimony to dealing with anxiety, dealing with depression, all part of the great adventure, the great adventure that we're all on. So, you know, during the great adventure, you get a few scars, you know, sometimes things don't go well, but it's still part of the adventure. So, 
um, and I have a sleep disorder. So as you get older, just all kinds of things start falling off. You know, when you hit, when you hit 50, just expect to lose a few parts or have to have some parts replaced. Uh, I turned 60 this year, and it's, it's re what we're talking about is really important because you have an assignment. I have, a, I have several assignments in my life, and I need to live another 60 years to make them happen. And that's what Genesis says. After the flood, God said, man's days will be 120 years. I'm counting on that. I have a 60-year plan to move forward. And I would encourage you all to do the same. So let me give you a little outline of what we're talking about. I'm going to define mental health from Christ's perspective, or at least how I derive that. We're going to talk about happiness from both a secular and a biblical perspective. We're going to talk about depression, and then you'll see how I lump it all into Mother's Day at the end. So um, here's where you get, you're going to have to stay with me and jump some slides. Get on to the one that says Jesus. So in terms of defining mental health, the Bible doesn't use the term. If you look up mental health in the Bible, you're not going to find it. So there are a lot of things you're not going to find, you know, how to watch TV. There's all kinds of stuff in the Bible you're not going to find direct guidance to. So we have to read and study and ask the Spirit to reveal what the Word says today. And so what it says to me when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And he said, then he threw in the second one. The second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. And, and this is... This is a, these are commands. That means that you must do this and that God will empower you to do this. That's, you know, he's not going to command you to do something that he's not willing to help you with. And depression can affect all these elements. So if you love God with all of your heart, we were doing that in worship, our passion being directed toward God, music, art, uh, things that we are passionate about. Even your love for sports can be directed to God if you approach it in a godly fashion. Um, when you're loving God with all of your soul, that's, the exp that's also translated mind. The Greek word is synonymous with mind. So what you think, what you believe, your personality, right thinking, directed toward God, all that is loving God with all of your soul. With your strength, that's your physical being. And so if you were, you're here, I'm talking to you. So you were obedient, you got your physical strength out of bed, you came here to church, and you are loving God with your strength by being here, by tithing, by giving of the things that support your strength, by, by doing charitable deeds, by helping people. All that is loving God with your strength, with your physical being, and all that you have. And so depression causes us to not feel good, which can feel like we don't have any passion to direct to God. It causes us to think negatively, which takes our soul into a dark place. It causes us to feel weak in our frame and to withdraw from social relationships was this, is the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. The as yourself is like Christ saying, oh, of course you love yourself. Of course you have some kind of esteem for yourself. Of course you know how to care for yourself. But when you're depressed, you, you lose that too. You lose self-care, self-esteem, the ability to care for yourself. You really need help from others. And so in my life, I have needed somebody else to be loving me as they love themselves and help me keep my head straight when I couldn't think right. And, and we're here today because we need each other. You know, you could have stayed home and watched church on TV, right? But you wouldn't have had the opportunity to say hello to somebody. You wouldn't have the opportunity to thank them for being obedient and showing up today. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, thank you for being obedient. Will you do that today? Thank you for being obedient. Because we, we are the physical manifestation of the church. We got out of bed and we came to be here with God and with each other. And that encourages me. I hope it encourages you when you look back and they had to raise the divider. Hey, we got too many people to fill the front. That's awesome. That's terrific. Um, so let's talk about uh, happiness. You're going to see I just kind of bang through things here. So if you'll go to the blessed, blessed, happy slide. By the way, you do have a little handout, and I will, I'll forget to tell you where to fill in the blanks. You've got to pay attention. If, if you're kind of obsessive and have to fill in all the blanks, you've got to pay attention. So, um, so blessed is a word that you're all familiar with. It's, it's biblical. People will often say now, be blessed, you know, when they're saying hello, goodbye. Um, it comes from a combining of two concepts in ancient Greek of happy, which is the feel-good happy that we all think about, and virtuous, which was the be good. So it's be good happy is what blessed means. And this is the biblical concept of happiness. Um, it's very different than the, than the U.S. culture. In, in, in popular U.S. culture, to be blessed is to be rich, famous, to have significant influence, to have what you want. That's, that's how most of us really, if we're honest, think about blessing. If I get what I want, I'm blessed. If I win the lottery, I'm super blessed. But that is not a biblical concept. And so uh, I go to the King James Bible because it uses more blessed than anywhere else. If you just want to read English and look up blessed, you've got to go back to the King James because it uses all kinds of crazy blessed. You've got blessed, blessed, blessedness, blessest, blesseth. How often have you said, blesseth art thou this morning, oh, my wife? Um, 
blessing and blessing. So 519 times it shows up in the King James Bible. It's a common construct, common concept. And in the Beatitudes is where we see this used, to me, defining happiness from the biblical perspective, where Jesus is, it's a Sermon on the Mount. He's teaching and he's, and he's preaching and he's telling people what it means to be blessed. And it is not U.S. culture, folks, what, what, it, what involves being blessed. So what I've done is I've taken the word happy uh, I'm going to Romania on Wednesday, and one of the challenges of going into another culture is the languages don't necessarily mesh. There is no Romanian word for blessed. It doesn't exist. And so if you pick up the Romanian Bible and read the Beatitudes, it will literally translate happy. So I've done that today, just so that we're clicking with this biblical concept of happy. So I'm just going to run through this with you. Happy are the poor in spirit. And, and contrast every one of these to U.S. culture and what most people would say is blessed, right? Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, poor in spirit puts us in a position of gratitude. We are, we are, we are understanding our position with God. We are poor in spirit. He is rich. And actually, that directly affects happiness. When you're in a position of gratitude, it's impossible to be grateful and sad. It's impossible to be grateful and angry. Gratitude by itself puts us in a position where we will experience blessing. So that one kind of makes sense. Happy are those who mourn. This makes no sense. Happy are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So the first verse, three, is, is present tense, is. When you are poor in spirit, yours is the kingdom of heaven. But if you are mourning, you will be comforted. And you'll see all the rest are future tense. All the rest are blessed are you, happy are you, because something good's coming. And that's the, that's the way the rest of this goes. And that is the Christian adventure. When you are in the worst ditch of despair, you know how the story ends. You know where you end up. You know who your heavenly father is. You know your value in the kingdom of God. Whether you are happy, whether you're depressed, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, none of that matters. You know the end of the great adventure. And so all these are future tense. Happy are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. Happy are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. That one sort of makes sense to me. You know, have, I am happy when I'm giving mercy. Uh, in the moment, happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That sort of makes sense. Next one, happy are the peacemakers. They'll be called the children of God. That sort of makes sense. This one makes no sense. Happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's really tough to be happy when you're persecuted. He even gets more specific in verse 11. Happy are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That's not my normal state of mind to be happy if you're calling me names and treating me mean, right? That's just not you know, of the flesh. That doesn't happen. Um, Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, this reference, they persecuted the prophets before you, means death even. And, and, and Jesus is described by Paul, for the glory to come, he endured the cross. For the hope of the glory to come, he endured the cross. And that has to be our perspective. In our great adventure of life, for the hope of what God is doing now through us and in us, we are going to move forward. We're going to persevere. But to the, to, to the world, that's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. You know, is this some kind of, kind of foolishness is what came to mind. As I was reading and preparing for this, I thought this would just look like foolishness to anybody. And in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3, Paul actually addresses that directly. He says, God's wisdom seems foolish to man. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 for the wisdom of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. So when you who are born again read the Bible, you are reading something you can understand. It makes no sense to the world. God's spirit has to move people in people, drawing them into his kingdom before they can even get any of this. So if you don't know Jesus this morning, this may seem like foolishness to you, everything that I'm saying, because it is counterculture. It is not what people really want to hear and believe and know. But it is salvation. It is the way to experience joy in all contexts. 1 Corinthians 3.19, he flips it the other way. He says, for the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's sight. So, he, so there's really two sides here. There's the world and there's the kingdom of God. And they do not mix well. They do not mix well. James 1, he says, consider it pure joy. This is really a powerful, strong expression. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I have faced trials of several kinds, not every kind. I've shared with you a little bit of the trials that I've faced. And it is not easy to consider it joy when you're depressed. But I theologically knew this, and so I grounded myself in several verses, that I, a couple I'll share as we proceed here. I grounded myself in scripture. I surrounded myself with people who love God, who could speak to me when I didn't love myself, and assure me that I still had value to the kingdom. I happened to have a Christian physician. Every time I saw him, he would say, when you feel better, 
when you are feeling better, you will. And so he was speaking prophetically into my life. It was real hard for me to receive that. That's the state of depression. You don't, the good stuff just doesn't stick. And so you need people around you. You need yourself to force yourself to embrace those things that will keep you grounded in the word and in Christ. So uh, in James 1, he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Testing of your faith. Your faith is not tested when somebody gives you a nice birthday gift. There's no great faith to say, oh, isn't God good? I've gotten a nice birthday gift. Your faith is tested when the day really stinks, and yet you proclaim that God is good because you know of what is to come. That's where your faith is tested. And people who are depressed are tested every day. Every day your faith is tested if you are dealing with depression. Doesn't mean you're going to lose your faith necessarily. Doesn't mean that God doesn't love you more than somebody else because he doesn't alleviate your depression right away. He is giving you an opportunity to testify to the world that God is good. Look at this. He loves me even when I'm depressed. That's the, that's the posture of, of us if we are really walking with him. So that you will become mature and complete, not lacking anything. Mature and complete, not lacking anything. So um, just shout this out. What, if, if you've ever known a kid, a child, that has never experienced trials, that has never experienced frustrations, what do you have? Did I hear Brat? Right? right? Right. Came right out, right? Boom. That's what you got. So, so to become mature, I mean, I don't want to be a child all my life, you know? And there are people that actually grow up in environments where they experience very little frustration. They don't, they, don't, they don't develop stress tolerance. They don't develop an understanding of what to do when things don't go right. And there is not a life on the face of the earth where everything, go, everything goes right all the time. God does not intend, you know, it's a fallen world to start with. And, and God has taken that fallen world and he uses our trials to develop us. That's what James is saying here, including depression. So you'll be lacking nothing, nothing. So uh, if we don't suffer, we lack wisdom and knowledge. Uh, this is one of my anchor verses, Ecclesiastes 1.18, for with much wisdom comes sorrow, the more the knowledge, the more the grief. And so when I was not feeling well, I would sometimes angrily say, God, man, there's got to be something wisdom in this. This, is, this really stinks. So, you know, there's got to be something good coming from this. And, and there is. Um, my best stories are my worst stories. You get that? My, the the, the life-giving stories from my life are my worst stories. That's the testimony. This is, this, is what, this is where the world took me. This is where my foolishness took me. But God, in his faithfulness, does what he does. So you, you got to have some worse stories or else your, your testimony is really boring. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about a, a secular model of happiness. And, and what I've been a psychologist for 30 years. I've been doing this a long time. I have seen things come and go, fads come and go. But uh, what's happening is research gets better and better. It's coming more and more in sync with God's word. And so these five elements, the uh, PERMA, positive emotion, this is one of your checklisty things here on your handout, too. Uh, the ability to have positive emotion and to have it a lot is part of it, not all of it. Uh, to engage the mind. We are a disengaged culture. You know, how many of you will be listening to the radio, texting, and driving at the same time? You don't need to raise your hand. You'll, they'll, they'll rest you as you leave the place. But, but that's, that's our culture. That is, that is disengagement. Multitasking, well, the mind can only pay attention to one thing at a time. So multitasking is rapidly moving, rapidly moving. The most stressful position in my office is not even the boss's position. I have, I have 24 therapists I have to direct and one psychiatrist. We see 700 patients a week. We have a busy place. But the most stressful job is the receptionist who has to answer the phone, schedule, greet the person coming in. She has to multitask. She has to move her attention back and forth, back and forth. It's, it's really stressful. The lowest paying job is often the most stressful job in, in any organization. So what you want to do is, is on a Sabbath, which should be a 24-hour period of time where you devote yourself to rest and, and reflection on God, do something engaging of the mind. You know, after church, take a walk down to the beach. Take in the sun. Take in the light. Thank God for the good stuff. The more we engage our mind fully, and being a therapist, I, it's actually easy for me. If I'm doing my job and I'm talking to somebody for 45 minutes, for 45 minutes, you're it. You're, you're what, and your story is what I'm engaged in. So, so my world should be that way, but being the boss, I have to multitask all the time, so it gets kind of crazy. Uh, relationship is essential for a sense of well-being. Um, that sort of speaks for itself. Meaning, what, what, you know, pastors have some of the highest job satisfaction of anybody in our culture because almost everything they do professionally they see as having great meaning. That's really terrific. If you have, a, and my job is that way too. I believe in what I do, so I feel like I have great meaning. But you might have a job that doesn't seem to have much meaning. 
Um, <clears throat> I grew up in Dearborn, Michigan. And Dearborn was created by Henry Ford to house the workers of his rouge plant. So I was surrounded by people growing up who all they did was turn a bolt. This is before robots. This is back in the 60s and 70s. So, so they, would, they would do that. I mean, you, I would go nuts, right? But if that is the nature of your work, then what you have to do is be grateful that God has provided provision. Jehovah Jireh is providing employment. And be grateful that you only have to work 40 hours a week. That still leaves 128 to do what you want. In a, in a world that's been cursed, work is a curse, by the way. It's not a blessing. That it came from, remember that? It came from the fall. God said, okay, guy, you're going to have to work. Okay, so in spite of the curse, if you only have to work 40 hours a week and you make a living, that's a blessing. And so every time you turn that screw, tell yourself, that I'm grateful. I am grateful. And look forward to when you get off and you can go and be a Cub Scout leader and do stuff that you think really has meaning. Uh, accomplishment is just the way it sounds, too. The fact that I've done some things that I value, and, and the more important thing, I'm looking forward to accomplishment. I'm looking forward to going to Romania on Wednesday. And it, and it links into all this stuff. I'm going to re reconnect with friends I've been building. I'm going to do stuff that's meaningful. I'm going to feel good doing what we do. And I will feel that I'm accomplishing something uh, uh, for God's kingdom because it's one of my assignments. So anytime, like in school, you get a, even if you get a C, that's an accomplishment, right? You, you got it done, it was acceptable. So even if I get a C from God for going to Romania, it's still an accomplishment. So that's all part of the adventure. Now addictions engage just the first two. Pleasure, the pursuit of pleasure, and engagement of the mind. People that are addicted, and, and you all got something. Um, it, we, we think about it, we long for it, we plan for it, we, we engage it, we savor it. But the problem is, if it's really an addiction, it, we, too much of us goes to it. It becomes something bigger than it ought to be, and it actually harms the next three. So, so a hedonistic culture, the pursuit of pleasure, which is American culture, let's be honest, right? I mean, you look at all the media, it's all about me. It's all about what can I experience. It is, America is not culturally a godly nation by any stretch of the imagination. Therefore, we, God's people, have to keep our eyes focused on him. We have to keep encouraging each other to love and good works, as Paul writes to Timothy. We gotta keep moving forward. The obstacles to happiness are ignorance. If all you know is what they tell you on TV, you're essentially ignorant, uh, or isolation. When people are depressed, they don't wanna see other people. They feel deep shame. They wanna pull the curtains and go inside. Isolation simply breeds more foolishness in our own thinking. We become lost in our mind. Distractions are the stuff of life that you all engage in. I'm too busy to read the Bible. I'm too busy to pray. I'm too busy to go to church. Um, stress and trauma, you actually had a message on not too long ago. All that stuff can be an obstacle. Selfishness and depression can be an obstacle. So jump down to Winston, Winston Churchill's slide. So this is a picture of a guy who suffered severe recurrent depression, severe depression. Abraham Lincoln, another great leader, suffered severe depression. These guys led their nations through war successfully. I mean, so my point is, depression doesn't have to keep you from fulfilling your call. If God doesn't choose to miraculously remove depression from your life, it doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. It, it doesn't mean that he uh, doesn't have a plan for you. It means that your adventure includes the perseverance that it takes to deal with what you're dealing with. And the older you get, uh, my pastor uh, turned 50 a few years ago, and he said to me, you know, Paul, your preaching on healing sort of changes when you hit 50. Um, it, and that's because the parts start falling off and, you, and you, know, you, you have to face the realities of your mortality as you get older. So healing kind of takes on a different thing. The Bible actually has some people that were depressed, I think. Uh, King Saul, you, you remember stories of King Saul? He would go into a rage and David would come and play his harp and soothe his soul. He probably had bipolar disorder. He probably had a severe mood disorder. David himself writes about depression. In, you'll, you'll read one of the Psalms where he says, my bed is wet from my tears. My body aches with my mourning. He, those are severe symptoms of depression, constant crying and actual physical increase of pain. David knew what depression was, and Paul did also. He writes how he felt abandoned. If you read, if you read some of his letters, he, he felt totally abandoned, and he felt, uh, he doesn't say I'm depressed, but there was something that he had called the thorn in the flesh. Whether it was depression or not, we don't know. But he had something that didn't go away. He said, three times I've prayed for this. I'm not praying anymore. In my weakness, your strength will be evident. And he just pushed on and continued doing what he's doing. So we don't know if he struggled with more than the normal sorrow when his friends have abandoned him in life. But we know he had a tough life. And he wrote in Philippians 4, I've learned to be content in all things. All this stuff is just amazing stuff. So jump down to a slide that says 26 to 40% adults in the USA. These are just a few numbers I want to share with you. 
in this room right now, up to 40% of you are dealing with something. That's a big number, up to 40%, and 10% of you are dealing with depression. That's a big number. So I tried to craft this message so I'm just not talking to the 10%, because the message for all of us is, hey, let's learn about the troubles of life. Let's learn about how to identify them. Let's learn about how to lead people who need to be led into fellowship with God while he's in the process of healing them. That's, that's really the, the kicker from this message. Children also, 40% of children in this building may be dealing with something. And uh, depression is not as common with children. It actually increases with age. So ADD is statistically a very common thing. And you can kind of look at that list and see there's just stuff that kids have to deal with as they're growing up. So where does depression come from? Um, it comes from genetics, and it comes from stress. I'm going to share with you as I close out my family tree. You'll see where, where my genetics lead. And this, uh, I've already shared with you, periods of stress are when this comes out. But you can get so dysregulated by depression that you have to have help. And that's where medicine comes in. Paul said to Timothy, he writes, take a little wine for your stomach. Wine and oil were medicine back then. Paul traveled with Luke, a physician. So whatever he was dealing with, he believed in getting the help that he needed. And, and he believed that sometimes you need medicine to love the Lord your God with all your strength. So don't be ashamed if you need medicine for a mental illness. It is God's provision to bring you into a state where you can perhaps finish the assignment that he's given you in life. Um, the Dark Night of the Soul it goes back to pre-Protestant years. The Protestant church really isn't that old. Before the Protestant church was the Orthodox church. And St. John of the Cross writes about how God will take away his presence in order to purify you. Um, a more modern person, Mother Teresa, writes the same thing in her memoirs. She writes in her memoirs that for 50 years, I did not personally experience the presence of God through most of her adult ministry, which was really powerful in, among the poor in, in India, she did not feel God's presence, and yet she persevered. So we need testimonies like this for those days that don't go so well for us. Um, we have a, a very courageous testimony that we're going to watch right now. So if you'll watch on the screen, you'll hear one of your own give testimony to God's goodness. My name is Jen. I've been attending Vineyard with my husband and three daughters for about a year and a half now. When I was younger, I was involved in an abusive relationship. Um, it left me feeling unworthy, um, confused, angry, um, lost. A little while after that relationship ended, um, my parents and I decided it was probably time to see a counselor. It worked to a point. Um, it did help me get through talking out those experiences, and um, I was able to forgive. I found forgiveness in that but it never really got deep down to those deep feelings of um, feeling unworthy and sad and confused and angry. Shortly after um, that relationship, I met my now husband. And um, within five years of being married, we had gotten married and had three daughters. Um, when our youngest daughter was born, um, shortly after she got really sick, and um, that kind of tapped back into those feelings of being depressed and just feeling sad and overwhelmed. Um, I remember crying pretty much every single day um, and just feeling overwhelmed and stressed and lost. Shortly after that, I was actually diagnosed with postpartum depression. And that was the first time in a while, in all this time that I've been experiencing these feelings, that I actually now had a name for what had been going on and what I was feeling. So my doctor prescribed me with antidepressants and they worked to a point. Um, they helped me cope with, you know, crying all the time and just feeling overwhelmed and stressed out, but they didn't help with the deeper feelings that I had been feeling. A few years later, um, our two oldest daughters were invited to go to a vacation Bible school with their friends and they had a great time. They sang songs, and they learned about Jesus and who he was, and I remember thinking, we have to find a home church. We need to find a place where the girls can grow in that relationship, and little did I know that coming to Vineyard um, was going to be the answer to, you know, finding out how I could cope with what I'd been experiencing, and I remember sitting in the in the sanctuary and hearing the words, you are not lost, you have not been lost. And I remember just thinking, what? You know, like, I haven't been lost this whole time, you know. 
God's been right here this whole time with, you know, all these years. I remember just feeling right in the very deepest part of, you know, where I'd been feeling completely helpless and lost and sad and unworthy, you know, just this warmth, you know, he was, he was healing me. He healed me right here. And um, I haven't looked back since. I appreciate that. It takes a lot of courage to be willing to be transparent and share something like that. And so postpartum depression is, is, is hormonally created. The, the origins of that are in hormonal changes that disrupt the regulation of the brain, often needing help with re-regulation. But that alone, she testifies, isn't enough. And being in fellowship is a big part of staying right in your own head and heart. And so, again, I thank you all for coming today. So if you want to help somebody, you have to pay attention. You have to know somebody to be of, of service. And it's good to know yourself as well. So changes in mood may mark the onset of depression. Not just sadness, even irritability. Someone gets irritable. That might be depression. Their, their very appearance. They may take less care of their appearance. When I was depressed, it was difficult for me to stand upright. And so when you see someone that normally is kind of more energetic but is starting to slump, that might, that might be depression. That was me. Changes in behavior and behavioral patterns. More isolation, less engagement, uh, sleep, as I mentioned. Appetite can go, and any of these can go up or down. Sleep can be more or less, appetite more or less. You might lose weight, you might gain weight as this goes on, and then energy can be depleted. So you have to be able to pay attention to that, and then you need to be able to engage a person with these specific questions. And so these are another fill-in-the-blank jobbies. So you ask, are you stressed? And, and, and if you are in a relationship with someone, hopefully they'll answer, and you can engage in discussion. Are you stressed? Are you sleeping? Are you eating? Do you feel depressed? Do you feel anxious? Any change in drinking habits? If, you're, if you do consume alcohol, has it, gone, has it increased? Um, if you do consume caffeine, has it increased? A lot of people try to use caffeine to bolster themselves when they, when they don't have energy. And then the big one, uh, the, the, the horrible ending to some depression is suicide. And so people always ask, well, how do I know if someone's suicidal? The answer is ask them. I, how often have you had suicidal thoughts? Have you ever had a suicidal thought? Have you ever had a thought that life might not be worth living? And if you have meaningful relationship, you can engage. So then what do you do? Well. I always recommend that people go to their doctor because there could be something physical affecting depression. Chronic diabetes creates depression. There are many conditions that need to be ruled out by seeing your doctor. Your doctor can also prescribe medication if he or she feels it's necessary. But besides that, talk to a friend. Be in relationship. Talk to your pastor. For Pete's sake, he asked a psychologist to speak. So he's perfectly willing to talk to you about something like depression. Um, as well as the Vineyard Resources, there's a nice little pamphlet I was received yesterday. It's all crumpled up because I had it in my pocket. And it lists resources here, some of which will help people who are dealing with depression. So your church values this stuff. And you can hire a professional counselor. There's the ad. Quick little flash of an ad for our group. So we've got 24 people and an adult psychiatrist. Happy to engage you in this. Dr. Bay, our psychiatrist, is also an ordained pastor. So he's a real uh, different kind of bird. He's just happy to pray with you as to give you a pill. So, uh, so we exist, and there, are, and there are other people in the community. We are really rich in Christian professional resources. We have Regent University cranking out graduates every year. So, so they're here. We're here. And, uh, and we structure our, our fee base to serve everybody. So there's a way to get help at Eden Counseling. So I'm going to shift uh, to Mother's Day. This may seem kind of abrupt. You'll see how it ties in. Um, and so you need to go all the way down to Paul Honors the Good Enough Mother, and we're going to wrap up with a little biography, all right? So my mother was born in 1930. She, she was a child in the Great Depression, and these events shape your life. She was a child in the Great Depression. Uh, she married my father in 53, and they had their first son in 55, yours truly. Um, so we're just going to pump through these slides like a, like a really fast slideshow. So this next picture is a 16-year-old Joyce Marilyn Imhoff. She was tall, she was intelligent, she was al already a college graduate, and she worked in a bank for a year to save money to go to a Christian community college. Um, the next slide shows her at the uh, four-year institution in Greenville, Illinois. Some of these I just show for, so you get a yuck at the dress. So, so this is 95 degrees. Picture ODU campus, 95 degrees. They don't dress like this over down at ODU in, in 95 degrees. Uh, next slide shows her graduation, and here's where I'm starting to show some generational stuff. The man in the middle had a sixth grade education, he was the custodian of a local high school. He single-handedly built a church, literally. He was a mechanical genius, though an uneducated man. Uh, both he and my grandmother were children of farmers. So they were, you know, so flip the next slide real quick. Um, so they were like this. You, ever, you know, this is, this is the iconic Grant Wood American Gothic depicting 19th century farmer and his daughter. 
that depicts my grandparents. I mean, salt of the earth, but, but sober, really, really sober people. Um, and, uh, and that soberness comes out of the hard life that they live. So out of that soberness also comes, my mother told me that she never heard her father tell her that she loved him. Now, now that's a terrible thing. She says, I know he loved me, but he never told me. And I grew up in a similar environment. What, what happens is, as you look back on the generational patterns, we read in Exodus that the wrath of God is passed down to the third and fourth generation for the sins of the fathers. You all familiar with that? But then it goes on to say, but the blessings are passed down to a thousand generations. And so as, as my mother did a little bit better telling me that she loves me, we did a little bit better telling my kids that we love them to the point that my mother was saying to Jeremy one day, he was four, Jeremy, do you know that I love you? He rolls his eyes and says, you tell me that every day. <laughs> and that's the world that I wanted to, to develop having lived what I lived. So my mother uh, was on the far left of that picture. Next to her is her sister. They're the first educated people uh, um, in the Imhoff family, although my grandmother's family had education. And the third party on the, uh, your, well, whatever direction it is, um, the dark hair was actually an informal adoption. She's actually the niece, though she has always been my aunt. So you have here Christian love and service and grace, but, but somber and serious. And my grandmother always looked like that. Um, you, there are pictures of her in her 20s, and she looked like that. She had pre, <laughs> seriously, premature gray hair. She just always looked old. And, and she suffered from severe anxiety. So there's some of the genetics coming down. My mother struggled with it. I struggled with it. Next slide shows my mother as a beautiful bride. Uh, getting married, just to give you a period look at, at how well wedding dresses looked back then, uh, and uh, no open backs, none of that business in a, in a conservative Christian church. Um, so the next slide shows some more generational stuff. Here you have pastors, missionaries, uh, nuclear engineers, really, really brilliant, highly educated people that had some problems. So down my family tree come some serious addictions, some serious anxieties, some serious ob obsessive, compulsive, perfectionist, judgmental tendencies, and some serious narcissism. So not everything that, that those people did was good, not everything they passed down was good. And that would describe your family tree, right? You all have a few horse thieves back there someplace and people that didn't, didn't do right. And, and, but, but we're called, you know, God will take all that stuff and make you what he wants to make you if we let him, if we do this together, if, if, we, if we move forward. And so I believe that we have improved generation to generation in my family, and I'm looking forward to what my kids are going to be able to do, passing those blessings on to a thousand generations. So the next picture I just, is just for, for yucks. Um, my father is, uh, he could actually go down the street wearing that today, right? Converse, tennis shoes, right? My mom, not so much. She'd get laughed out of Walmart with that, with that outfit. Um, this happens to be where they honeymooned, the same place I honeymooned, honeymooned. It's a family property in Michigan. So it's the same place where my wife and I did our honeymoon. Next slide shows a mother nurturing a child who could die. So their first son was very sickly and, was, and, and required a lot of extra care. But a good enough mother does whatever it takes. She gets up in the middle of the night. She takes care of her baby. I was miraculously healed uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a prayer time. I should have died. They tried all the medical stuff. My, the physician was a, was a Christian. They all prayed. My fever broke. I lived. So I speak to you of the power of a healing God because my assignment wasn't done. Had, had my assignment been done, I would have died. My parents would have been, had their faith tested with having lost a child, but that wasn't the story, praise God. And so I'm here because they were obedient and sought the great healer when all else was gone. So the, so the next slide shows this kid that survived. And a, and a good enough mother who is proud of her child. A good enough mother loves her children. Um, next slide, she will play with her children. Uh, look what she's wearing as she's playing in the yard with her son. Uh, so she was a pastor's wife. This is like leave it to beaver, right? You know, June Cleaver, pearls in a dress, doing the dishes. Um, and so uh, next slide, she celebrates life with her kids. Next slide, she had four of them, which I wouldn't wish on anybody, especially us. Um, but, but she loved them all, and they all had issues. She's holding my youngest brother, Steve, he went off the rails. When he was uh, in his late 20s, he left his wife. He entered into a life of addiction. Uh, he remarried. They since have rededicated their life. God saw fit to afflict him with muscular sclerosis. He now is in a wheelchair. He could live maybe a few more years. But he is one of my heroes. His testimony to the faithfulness of God through the, old, the choices he made that shipwrecked his life and the lives of his children, shipwrecked his family, but God is faithful, and he is one of my heroes. He exists with a life-ending disease Every day is, he experiences suffering with that, and he does complain some, uh, but, but through it all, he is testifying to the glory of God who preserves him in the midst of his suffering. So, so I hope you have heroes that you can point to and say, hey, this is how I want to be. 
if things get really tough, really tough. Next slide, more generational stuff. Um, Becky's dad was a pastor, and, and he died young of an affliction, and they carried in his family some powerful addictions uh, that altered the course of several generations. Next slide, this is my mother who, on her deathbed, she died of cancer in 2001, um, and so this is the last gathering of her uh, daughter-in-law and her children. I later was, I stayed and I actually was at her bedside when she died. Um, she would not accept that God wasn't going to heal her. And so she, she testified to her physician. I was present with the physician when he said, there's nothing more we can do. And she said, that's okay, God's going to heal me. And the problem with that was she wasn't willing to talk about death. And I kind of wanted to. I wanted to celebrate her life while she was alive. But she was the one dying, so she gets to decide how to do that. So, but, but she was faithful, and, and he did heal her. The day she died, she was standing before him, healed. And so sometimes when we pray for healing, we might be praying for the end of this life because it's full of death. Life, life is rough. So I want to honor her and the woman next to her, my, my beautiful wife, Becky, who's been my wife for 38 years, loving me in spite of me at times, um, which is really important. The next slide shows my mother and my father when I remember them. This is the early 70s. They were at the heyday of their ministry. They took a church of 150 to 750. They divided that church. They planted another. So this is, this is the mental image I have of her when she was fulfilling her assignment as a healthy, young, vibrant Christian mother. All right? So what do we do when we know a Proverbs 31 woman. That was my mother. If you, know, if you read Proverbs 31, she works all the time. She takes care of everything. She makes money. She contributes to social welfare. She allows her husband to just sit with the guys shooting the breeze. That's the Proverbs 31 wife. So um, we read in Proverbs 29 that um, it's a declaration, and I want us to do that. I want all the women to stand up, and you'll need to put the uh, Proverbs 31. There you go. All the women stand up, all, even if you're not married. I want all the women to stand up because your future could, could, this could be a statement. I want the men to either affirm or prophetically say this with me. We're just going to read this together, all right? Here we go. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Okay, men, one more time. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Have a seat, ladies. So that could be prophetic. That could be a declaration of your life. The point being, you may not feel that that describes you. It's not too late. I know a God of great grace and forgiveness. I know a God that can take a broken life and make it something spectacular. I live that testimony. Now, I'm not, I'm not that spectacular. My wife will tell you that. But anyway, um, so what we need to do, uh, verse 31, honor her for all that her hands have done. Let her works bring her praise at the city gate. And so what you do is, last slide, praise her privately and publicly, thank her privately and publicly, and here's the final kicker. You honor your mother by living an honorable life. As I wrap up here, I want the prayer ministers to come forward. Those of you that, that help with that sort of thing, just come on up, stand up here. Um, at any time in the next few moments or after I lead in prayer, if you want prayer for anything, come on up here. If you don't know Jesus, you got to come up here and join the club. And, and if you're struggling with something, come on up here and get prayer. I have heard from God myself most often when I've come forward for prayer. He has spoken to me and declared something I needed to hear. So if you feel that, that inkling, just start right now. Come on up and just come here and pray. So to live an honorable life, honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth. That's the only command with the promise. And the best way to honor your parents is to live an honorable life. The, the last word is whether you're depressed, whether you're in poverty, whether you're with anxiety, whether things are not going right, you can still live an honorable life. You can still do the next right thing. And the next right thing might be testifying, seeking help, telling someone else, encouraging someone else. So as we go out today on Mother's Day, I want you to celebrate that. I want you to forgive your mother if she wasn't a good enough mother. I want you to forgive yourself if you weren't a good enough mother. And if you're still alive and you weren't a good enough mother, start today. Become the woman that can surpass all things. I serve a God of great promise, and he has helped me through my times of depression. Let's close in prayer. So Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, for these people, these women, these mothers, these mothers-to-be, these grandmothers. Give us an opportunity to understand what it means to live honorably. Give us gratitude so that we can sleep well at night. Give us hope so we can make it through the tough times. Give us wisdom and understanding so we can get better if getting better is your path for us. Help us to not be stubborn, to not get help. Help us to not be prideful. Help us to not be judgmental and withhold help from others. Give us 
the spirit that allows Jehovah Jireh to provide, Jehovah Rapha to heal. Let this be a place of healing and prosperity and growth the way you want it to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.